In October, Zoom launched end-to-end -end encryption for our video conferencing platform, five months after we first published a white paper detailing our designs in May. I probably don't need to tell this crowd why offering end-to-end -end encryption is important. End-to-end -end encryption, or as I'll refer to it, end-to-end, -end, ensures that no intermediaries can see your communications, protecting users in the case of eavesdroppers and server breaches. These threats are far from theoretical. Servers do get compromised, whether by attackers, malicious employees, service providers, or governments. And consumers want and expect end-to-end -to, -end to protect their privacy. From Signal to Google Duo, end-to-end -to -end is increasingly available and mainstream. Gone are the days where you had to choose between security and custom emojis. I joined Zoom in May with the Keybase team, and I'm one of the engineers who has been working on building end-to-end -end in Zoom. In this talk, I'll cover two main topics. First, I'll describe how we quickly integrated end-to-end -end into an existing video conferencing product to achieve properties on par with many other secure communication applications. Second, what we deployed in October is only the first phase of our intended work. I'll broadly explain how we are extending our protocol to, to support cryptographically defined user identities and secure mechanisms for establishing trust. Users should know who they're talking to, even without having to trust Zoom. After all, end-to-end -end encryption is only as secure as its ends. So let's get started with how we arrived at our design. The primary task for implementing end-to-end -end is having the clients generate their own keys to encrypt their communications. What's a Zoom meeting like? Zoom supports large video meetings where each participant is synchronously streaming audio video data sent through Zoom servers to every other meeting participant. But meetings can include as many as a thousand people. Users can join and leave throughout, though there are a couple server controlled meeting settings that a designated meeting leader may configure, which control or restrict joins and leaves. Without end-to-end -end turn on, meeting contents are already encrypted by the clients with a symmetric meeting encryption key. Zoom servers actually do minimal processing of the video streams and therefore don't need access to the plain text meeting contents. However, the server must possess the meeting key in order to support some widely used Zoom features, including joining a meeting from a telephone, cloud recording, and live transcription. For this reason, the server generates the meeting key. This trade-off offers important functionality while still protecting protecting against eavesdroppers on the network. But as I described earlier, the trust model for end-to-end -end requires that only the meeting participants and not any intermediaries or the server are able to decrypt the meeting contents. And active attacks to gain access to a meeting should be detectable. So to build end-to-end -end most simply, we needed to instead have a client generate this meeting key and securely exchange it with other participants. We wanted to be able to deploy this to production as soon as possible. And as with any other production system, we needed to minimize implementation risk. This meant minimizing modification of existing client code and reducing the introduction of complexity, which is more bug prone, while also not degrading meeting quality and performance. This sets the stage for the design that we came to. We have the aforementioned meeting leader generate the meeting key to send to each user. We already trust the meeting leader to perform meeting administrative functions. And since we can consider the meeting as trustworthy as the least trustworthy participant, we consider this a reasonable and simple design choice. In order to securely send the meeting key to each user, we have, the, have to introduce a couple more keys. Each user has a long-term key pair to start. This is a per device signing key pair where the private key never leaves the device. The user posts their device public key to the server, which stores a directory of user IDs and device public keys. Then for each meeting, the user generates a new ephemeral encryption key pair. The user signs the ephemeral public key along with some meeting specific context using the device secret key and shares this signed binding of the ephemeral public key with everyone in the meeting. As you can see in the diagram, we use existing Zoom hosted infrastructure as a bulletin board for clients to announce keys and other information to each other. So in order for a user to join the meeting, 
The leader computes a Diffie-Hellman shared secret from their own and that participant's ephemeral keys and uses the resulting secret to encrypt the meeting key for that participant. When users join and leave the meeting, which the leader learns from the server, the meeting leader rotates the meeting key to a new random meeting key so that participants can only decrypt the parts of the meeting that they were in. So now when we refer to a meeting participant, we mean a user that the meeting leader has shared the current meeting key with. Meeting participants need to know who they're in a meeting with. Especially in an end-to-end -end meeting, we don't want to rely on what the server tells us. Instead, everyone in the meeting wants to know from the meeting leader who the leader has keyed for. So we introduce a leader-driven participant list, which is generated and signed by the leader. Here you can see the leader sending out regular heartbeats with updates to the participant list. In an end-to-end -end meeting, the participant list and video boxes that you see in the UI, instead of being server trust, are backed by this leader-driven participant list. This list ensures that all participants see a consistent view of all the users who the honest leader has shared the meeting key with. Note that at this stage, the display name seen in the UI can be arbitrarily changed. We will revisit associating a human-friendly identity with a participant's device key in the next phase of work. Participants expect these heartbeats at least every 10 seconds. Recall that the leader should be rotating the key when participants join and leave. So in particular, participants are watching out for these heartbeats so that the server cannot force them to keep using an old encryption key that is known to a recently expelled participant. A leader drops out if it misses enough participant list heartbeats from the leader. If the meeting leader changes, maybe because the original leader left the meeting, participants will be shown a leader changed notification. The new leader rotates the meeting key and is in charge of updating the participant list. Also, we have a meeting leader security code that may be read out loud to help each per meeting participant detect meddlers in the middle between them and the meeting leader. Every meeting participant upon joining the meeting should check the security code with the leader. And if the leader changes, then the security code changes and therefore needs to be rechecked. So checking the code can be clumsy. Our future phases of work intend to surface better user identity information that will make this check less necessary. We've now basically described the end-to-end -end design, which includes the meeting key messages and the participant list heartbeat messages that the leader is sending to meeting participants throughout a meeting. Let's go into some of the performance-related rela realities that influenced our protocol implementation. It's important to note that while we are streaming megabytes of video data over UDP, these new messages that we've introduced to support end-to-end -end are sent over a reliable TCP channel, and our protocol needs to be performant on bad networks and old cheap phones. Of highest priority is to make sure that joining a meeting is as easy as possible. The most important part of joining and staying in a meeting is getting the meeting key. Especially because we're working with synchronous auto video data, we want to get meeting keys to all the participants as fast as possible, and then rely on reasonable timing thresholds for, for the participant list heartbeats to enforce our security properties. You could imagine a protocol that couples rekey and participant list, me list messages together to enforce a tighter rekey property, but it was advantageous from an engineering perspective to not build in a stronger dependency in order to reduce the risk of bugs or of affecting meeting performance. Another thing that we do to reduce spikes in meeting key traffic is that we throttle rekeys, such that the leader might not rekey for every participant join or leave, or leave if they happen within a short period of time, but will rekey within 15 seconds. Joins and leaves happen more often than you might think, especially at the beginnings and ends of large meetings. To speak to how we determined the participant list heartbeat frequency, we needed to, to consider what is a reasonable user experience in terms of how frequently the participant list in the UI would update, for example, while also not producing overwhelming network traffic, which would also affect the user experience. To that goal of minimizing network traffic, we made various optimizations to the participant list data structures such as representing the heartbeats as an incrementally updated list of participant changes. Lastly, whether it's a new face in the participant list or a new leader, these UI changes need to be noticed and reviewed. 
This can be especially difficult in large meetings. Or consider, even if your client drops out of a meeting after missing too many heartbeats, it's simply difficult to tell if the server is withholding messages or if your network was just temporarily slow. With every notification we expose in the product, we consider its potential to contribute to alert fatigue. Now I'd like to summarize a couple more details about how we were able to quickly integrate our changes into the existing architecture for our October launch. For the client side changes, our engineers built a small library that takes care of generating the meeting key and the leader participant list, which exposes a small interface that the rest of the Zoom client code uses. We're careful with anything that we add to this interface as it's very hard to change once we release it. Clients post their device public keys to what we call the key servers. In subsequent work, which I'll be describing next, clients may start posting additional identity information to these key servers. We built the key servers to be as standalone as possible. This means understanding the user and meeting data that is already managed by the existing Zoom servers and keeping our dependency on this data minimal and manageable. Lastly, though we re require clients to upgrade versions in order to begin using end-to-end -end meetings, we in general try to avoid client changes that are backwards incompatible. This is an, an important concern for us whenever we plan future work and bug fixes. We're now in progress implementing our subsequent plans to make it even easier for meeting participants to verify the security of their end-to-end -end meeting. Here we introduce the second big question of our work that we try to solve. How do you know who you are in a meeting with? In the remainder of my talk, I'll paint some broad strokes for how we'll make it easier for users to confirm that only the, only the meeting participants that they expect and trust are in the meeting and can decrypt its contents. To this end, it definitely helps if you can see and hear everyone in the meeting and you check meeting leader security codes. But in the worst case, cameras and microphones are off or you've never met some of the participants before. Additionally, participants can rename themselves. Of course, different end-to-end -end meetings have varying user privacy requirements. In some cases, a self-selected and server trust display name is completely adequate for identification. And in some cases, you know, we welcome the creativity. In this case, you'll want to check meeting leader security codes to, to detect any server interception of meeting contents. But because this check, as I've previously described, can be cumbersome, we want to build additional features that rely less on the security code and make verifying meeting security as effortless as possible. So the big question is, how do you trust that a device key is associated with a particular user identity? And relatedly, how do we expose those notions of user identity in the product? In our subsequent phases of work, we are building a notion of multi-device user identity which supports a more human-friendly and usable notion of user identity. And this identity will ultimately be committed in an externally auditable transparency tree. So this user identity includes a set of devices like a laptop and cell phone and their device public keys. And we introduce two unique human-friendly identifiers. This is your email address that you use with Zoom and a domain name for the account that your user is in. To quickly highlight this particular concept in Zoom, users may be part of an account, likely for their company or school. For the purposes of identifying the account, the account's admin will need to select a unique domain name or ADN. These user identifiers are mutable, but they must be associated with at most one user at a time. We store this information that tells us the state of a user's identity over time in an append-only list called a sig chain. By reconstructing the entire sigchain for a user, we get the current state of their identity. These user identities will then be committed to a transparency tree, which is built on top of a Merkle tree. The transparency tree is hosted by Zoom, but it is externally auditable. This further prevents the server from forking a user sigchain. In other words, showing different versions of the same sigchain to different users. Because all changes made to a sigchain must be committed to, any server misbehavior will always be able to be detected. To really quickly illustrate what the SIG chain and transparency tree designs do for us, consider the basic attack where the attacker somehow adds a device to Alice's identity. 
This can happen if the attacker successfully guesses Alice's password or if the attacker compromises the Zoom server. The attacker can now join a meeting with Alice's identity. But the SIGChain and transparency tree ensure that the attacker can't cover their tracks and erase the device that they added without being detected. When Alice comes back online, she can review any changes made to her identity and notice this new device. Our Zoom transparency tree is similar to certificate transparency and Keybase, but not completely. Unlike these other transparency trees where identities are completely public, Zoom identities are not. In addition, unlike with Keybase, we need to handle mutable user identifiers that work with the Zoom notion of user identity. The white paper goes into this in more detail. Now I'll broadly explain how this identity information will be displayed and verified by meeting participants. If the user would like, or if the meeting settings require identity information in order to join, the user may also share their user identity with their meeting partners. Note that as always, you can join a meeting as a guest using a fresh ephemeral device key, no sigchain data, and displaying only the display name as Carol is doing here. Here you can see, for example, that Bob has shared their user identity with Alice. Alice's client will automatically load the email and account domain identifiers associated with Bob's device key and display them in the UI, in addition to the display name. Now, Alice may decide if she expects and trusts these user identifiers displayed for Bob. In addition, we're implementing two other identity verification features. First, Alice's client will determine if it has seen Bob's identity before in a different meeting, whether on Alice's current device or another. If Alice hasn't met Bob before or this particular device of Bob's, Alice's client should indicate that by displaying a trust on first use style warning. Lastly, we'll, we will offer a feature for users and accounts that use an identity provider or IDP that allows the IDP to attest to a user's identity. Here we leverage the fact that many of our users already trust their IDP for authentication and therefore may also use the IDP as a trusted third party where, when verifying meeting participants identities. In our design, we must ensure that only the user's client and never the Zoom server can update the user identity that the IDP is vouching for. For more details on the engineering required to support these features, I encourage you to read the white paper. So now I'll finish this talk with three takeaways. First, the security of end-to-end -end encryption depends on knowing who is at the ends. Starting with a user's device public keys, we've constructed a human-centric notion of Zoom user identity. In our multiple phases of work, we aim to offer various options to make identity verification more effortless for the end user, including mechanisms that minimize the need to trust the server. Second, I hope this talk conveyed some interesting experiences about building end-to-end -end encryption in the real world. We built and are continuing to build and ship security features for a widely used application. And from day one, our design and implementation choices and the resulting security properties must account for existing architectural constraints, scalability and performance requirements, UI and UX considerations, and product needs. Lastly, is it secure is never a yes or no question. The answer depends on the security, privacy, and usability needs of your specific meeting, whomever it might be with. The answer also depends on your assumptions and at every stage of our work, how well those assumptions are communicated to and verified by end users. So I hope this talk offers more color into the many nuances of the security properties you might think about for your next video conferencing meeting and what it takes from an engineering perspective to achieve those security properties. Thank you.